Okay, you're recording. Okay, good morning. Okay, so welcome. We're back, back on Sundays by popular demand. So, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for those who logged in. Let us begin. We're continuing now. Tzuba Rabbanan. Very exciting. We're going through Hilchot Shabbat. We are on the second year. This is our third year of the current volume, but the first year actually took us two weeks. Uh, but we'll go through. We'll see how much we get through. And if we need to split it up again beyond the uh, more than one week, that's fine. But we're moving on. We've learned so far in what Erev Shabbat. We spoke about preparation for Shabbat and different aspects of that. And today we're moving on to uh, another aspect, perhaps, of preparation for Shabbat, which is Hadakat Nerot. We spent a couple of weeks talking about Hadakat Nerot, the mitzvah of lighting Shabbat candles. Lots and lots and lots to talk about here. So let's begin. On page 73, 73 in the books, we have the reason for lighting Shabbat candles. The truth is there are three reasons that are mentioned uh, in the Gemara and the Rishonim. Three reasons why we would light uh, light candles on Shabbat. And we'll see that nowadays, when you know, once upon a time, the only way that you had light in your house was through candles. Nowadays, generally speaking, people don't light candles for light. People use uh, they have electric lights. Um, so we're going to see how does electricity influence this whole takana of the of the Hadlakat Many questions that will come up. Would one be permitted to use electric lights instead of candles? That's one question which is discussed in the poskim and we'll get to it maybe today, maybe next week, I'm not sure. Another question is from the other side, we can ask nowadays that we have electric lights, are the candles still necessary? Can we still make a bracha on lighting candles when you don't actually need the candles? To light up your home. So that's something else which is discussed by the Poskim. So fascinating questions. But let's let's begin from the beginning. So page 73, source number one, the Gemara in Masech Shabbat. I also mentioned it's very timely that we're having the show now because this section in the Gemara in Shabbat where it talks about lighting candles and it talks about, begins a discussion of what candles you can use, what types of wicks and what types of oils would be suitable for Shabbat candles. So as a result of that, the Gemara goes into a discussion of which wicks and which oils you could use for Hanukkah candles. And Hanukkah, of course, is coming up this week. We've got the Hanukkah outside that's that's, uh, that's uh, getting ready to light. So, and this is the only place where, or the primary place, where the Gemara actually discusses the Hanukkah of Hanukkah. It's a few there is no Masechah Hanukkah, not in the Mishnah, not in the Gemara. Fascinating discussion of why that is. But uh, it's brought in this in the section of uh, the Shabbat. So some of the things we'll discuss today as well are, will be relevant to Hanukkah and we'll make reference to them. So says the Gemara, source number one, Sechet Shabbat. Amarav Nachman Barav Zavda, Barmila Amarav Nachman Barav Amarav. Hadlakat Ner Shabbat Chova. Okay, first thing is we see from here there is an obligation. There is a Chova. Chova is an interesting word. You know, the Gemara does not say Mitzvah. On the other hand, it does not say Rashut, it says Chova. We'll have to see what that means. There are such different ways the Rishonim understand. Chova, on the one hand, means you have to do it. Not everybody can decide. For example, there are certain instances the Gemara talks about in Yom Kippur, or Yom Kippur, that there were places where there was a minhag to say the bracha and light candles, places where there was not such a minhag. So, but we see this is a chova, but perhaps chova may mean that it's a lower level than mitzvah. We'll, we'll, we'll see what that means. I'm going to skip. We'll come back, don't worry, but I wanted to skip for a moment to page 86. Sorry, Mark. Um, page 86, the Gemara, which is a continuation of the Gemara, which explains what this Chova uh, is about. So it says here, yeah, this is again after the discussion where the Gemara lists the different uh, oils and different wicks which uh, which one can use for the candles. So it says, Rabbi Ishmael, it says that there is a certain, I mean, uh, source number 33 in page 86. That uh, using tar, using certain uh, uh, oils and fuels cannot be used for the candles. The Gemara here explains why. It says, Amarava, we talk Sherechora, because it has a bad odor. Zera, Shema if you light a candle that has a uh, made of tar or something with a bad odor, we're worried you'll light the candle, and then because it smells, you will leave the room. Amale Abaye Vetsa, Abaye says, So what? So let him leave. He says, no, because we have to have the lights uh, Nerot Shabbat. And that there is an indication that Gemara would seem to be that having the, the lights uh, should be in the place where you are having the meal, where you are eating, that it's associated with the Suzak Shabbat, as we'll see in a moment. 
Um, and again, this is going to be an upcoming, we'll get to it later on. What is the ideal place to light Shabbat candles? Most people at home have got their place near their table, that's okay. What happens when you go away, you go to a hotel, something like that. So we will discuss. But we see very clearly that lighting Shabbat candles is related to, at least in some way, shape or form, but it's related to the Sudat Shabbat, to the meal of Shabbat. So we're back on page 73, source number two, Rashi explains. He says, Kvod Shabbati. This is a part of the uh, honor of Shabbat, Kvod Shabbat. We spoke in the previous Shirim a little bit about Kvod Shabbat in terms of preparing for Shabbat and getting things ready and having fine food, etc. Another aspect of it is having lights lit, <coughs> having candles where you're going to have your meal. He says, says Rashi, should be like daylight. You should have proper light. <coughs> And that is the honor of Shabbat, that your meal should not be in the dark. So that is reason number one, which is mentioned. Notice the Gemara does not say explicitly what is the reason why we light the candles. It's, it's, we're only in the Rishonim. We'll see there is one place where the Gemara does give a reason. The Rishonim and Akronim will discuss whether that is actually the reason or that's just a, 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 a side point. But reason number one says Rashi, Kavod Shabbat. The honor of Shabbat is that we have candles lit where we have the meal. If you look over the page, source number three is Tosfot. Tosfot over here in the Gemara says, Chova, v'yeshol tzim, lomar. In the Valecha had la kat Okay, where are you again? Sorry, top of page 74. Source number three. Yeshol tzim lomar, the in the Valecha had la kat There are those who say that there should not be a bracha over candle lighting. Midakari le chova, because it's called a chova. Again, it's called a chova, an obligation in the, in the Gemara. It's not called a mitzvah. There is something else which is called a chova, and not a mitzvah. Says Tosfot. Says the Gemara Kulin. Says Mayim Machronim Chova. We're not going into now the discussion of Mayim Machronim. If you're interested, I think we've discussed it's in Volume 14. You can go back and, and uh, I refer you to that chair. But uh, discussion in our days whether Mayim Machronim, washing one's hands at the end of the meal to uh, before Berkat Amazon, whether that is still obligatory or not. Even though it's ironic, it's one of the only places where the Sukhana of rights, it's an obligation, and everybody argues whether it still is an obligation or not. My Machonim Chova, the Gemara there explained, my Machonim in their days, they had a certain type of salt, it was known as Melach Stomit, which it was dangerous if you had touched the salt during the meal, if you would touch your eyes, it could blind you. Nowadays, we don't have this Melach Stomit anymore, and therefore, some Rishonim say that my Machonim is not required nowadays. Others say, no, that was the, that was the decree. Just as it was required then, so it will be required now. Again, not getting into it now. But uh, in any event, over there, there's no bracha over my Machronim. Everybody agrees. There is a, there's no bracha. Um, and that says, my Machronim chova, but ain't to in bracha. So says Tosfot, in the same way that my Machronim is called a chova, and there is no bracha recited, perhaps, had lakat nerot, which is also called a chova, has no uh, uh, bracha required over it. Either. That is an opinion quoted by Tosfot, and then he says in the name of Rabbi Nutam, Tosfot in source number three, Tosfot of course is a, is a collection, and many, there's not just one author, the, the, the Tosfot, right, the, the Balea Tosfot, or a, a group of scholars who wrote this, so one of the most prominent amongst them was Rabbi Nutam, one of the grandsons of Rashi, and he writes, Amir Rabbi Nutam de Shibushu, says this is incorrect, the Delo Damila Maim Achronim, it's not the same. My machronim over there is an obligation, not in a sense of a religious obligation. It's in the sense of a hygienic, a, a, a safety obligation. That's why that's called chuba. That's what he says. Lighting a candle, lighting the candles for Shabbat, that is a religious obligation, right? Chuba shall mitzvah oneg Shabbat. It is a chuba of the mitzvah of oneg Shabbat. Okay, so that is reason number two. Rashi told us that we light candles for Kavod Shabbat, for the honor of Shabbat. Tosfot says that we light candles for Onen Shabbat, for the benefit, for the enjoyment of Shabbat. So we listed both of these precepts we learned from the Nabiim, that there's a, there a content of Onen Shabbat, a content of Kavod Shabbat. We'll talk in a moment what precisely is the difference between the two, because they are very similar and they are related. It's not completely clear where the line goes between Onen Shabbat and Kavod Shabbat. But nonetheless, those are the first two reasons we have that are brought by the Rishonim as to why it is that we need the candles, that we need the candles. Interesting, source number four, Tosfot says, 
continues. He says, what if you had a candle already lit from Friday afternoon? Your house is very dark. It's still daytime. It's not Shabbat. You had the candle lit so you could cook, whatever it is. Uh, or you have the candle for the sake of cooking, whatever. Says Tosfot, uh, that's Rabbeinu Tam. That's not good enough. You have to extinguish the candle and you have to relight it. It has to be lit for the sake of Shabbat. In other words, there's a question here. When we talk about Hadlakat Nero, we talk about lighting candles, and this is going to be very relevant when it comes to electric lights. Is the mitzvah, is the takana, that there should be a light lit, that we have the light where we have the Shabbat meal, or whatever it is, that there is light in the home, or is the mitzvah the actual the action of lighting the candle? Right? And there may there may be enough kamina between the two, there may be a ramification, there may not be. But yeah, from Tosfot, it seems from Rabbeinu Tam, seem to imply but there is something about the action of lighting the candle that has to be done. If you look at the Rambam in source number five, it sounds a little bit different. It says the Rambam, Shabbat, So first of all, this is not optional. This is not a good thing if you want or not. The Gemara said No, it's not like that. Um, about halfway through the Rambam, maybe uh, four lines from the end. This is an obligation. Both men and women need to have in their homes a candle which is lit on Shabbat. Notice what he says. He doesn't say you have to light a candle. He says you have to have a candle lit. Meaning this seems to be more of a result-oriented mitzvah than an uh, uh, act, act oriented. Again, the nafkamina would be if the light was lit beforehand, if the lights were on, have you fulfilled the, uh, have you fulfilled the mitzvah? Um, so the Rambam there includes this as part of Oneg Shabbat as well. Notice what he says, and this is based on the Gemara. But even if a person is poor and a person is begging for food, nonetheless he should go and he should uh, he should beg for he's not exempt from this matter of lighting the candle. Again, this comes up by, by Hanukkah candle as well. This idea of somebody who can't afford it. Yeah, Baruch Hashem, these are, these are very, very foreign concepts, I think, in our, in our day and age. Somebody who can't afford like, for, one, uh, for, for one candle. But nonetheless, we see from the other significance of, of the mitzvah. Yeah. If, I'm, if I'm right, there's also the I don't think we're going to get to the bracha today. So I'm just wondering, if you think that the bracha is the bracha, right? Yeah. And the bracha is the bracha, I mean... Based on this discussion, there is no mitzvah. So, Kovan, because of all mitzvah, right? Right. So, the question was asked regarding the bracha. The bracha is a shekel term mitzvah tavitzivan, but it's command that's lahad lit. And it seems to be that there is no mitzvah. So, the truth is that the, the Gemara asks this question in the context of the bracha for Hanukkah candle, because Hanukkah is a type which is. I don't really call it a chag, but it is a festival which is the Rabbanan. There is certainly no obligation in the Torah to light Hanukkah candles because it came later. Yet we say the Baha, Asher Kitan of Mitzvotah, because I'm not looking at the So the Gemara gives two answers. The more famous one is that no, we are commanded to follow, there's a, there's a Mitzvah of Lotasul, that we are commanded to follow the decrees of the rabbis, the decrees of Chazal. And therefore, when, when we say Asher Kitan of Mitzvotah, Commanded us to listen to the decrees of the Sanhedrin, and they enacted, therefore, that we should light the candle. So too, here. Yeah. Same here. Yeah, and here, yeah, it's maybe maybe it's a little bit of a higher level because the obligation of Onik Shabbat and of Kavod Shabbat is really uh, sourced in the Navi'im. Um, so it's maybe a little bit above Adra Banan. Um, yeah, like from Yeah. It's like it's a it's sort of a blanket idea that everything that like comes as a result of whatever zero we do have, right? And it's stuff that says that they are one of the but we don't have to do that. It's not like there aren't there aren't it's just not actually what I'm saying. But you know, saying that the Bible has been given all the time, there is a few other things, but not again, that we see for you know that much. So 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 the Gemara says that it says at the end of the day that it's a chovah, meaning at, at whatever stage it was established by the rabbis, by the neviim, by whoever, that part of owning Shabbat is everybody has to fulfill there are certain things which are subjective. If you like fish, you can eat fish. If you don't like fish, don't eat fish. But everybody has to light candles. That's part of the uh, that's the uniform uh, establishment. Now, what is the difference I mentioned between Oneg Shabbat and Kavod Shabbat? So one one explanation which is given by the Gra 
He says the difference is when it takes place. He says, Kavod Shabbat, the honor of Shabbat is everything we do to prepare beforehand. So all the shopping that you do and then setting everything up. Um, on Shabbat itself, that would fall into more of the category of uh, of uh, Onik Shabbat. You already see this in the Rambam. Rambam source number six, on page 75, he says, Ezu Kavod, Rambam gives us examples. What is a uh, Kavod Shabbat? Zeh Shamu Chachamim. Shemitzvah Adam Yechot Fanavi Adav O'Agrav B'chamim Be'el Shabbat is make for the Shabbat. Imagine that. He says, the fact that a person has to wash themselves in hot water on Arab Shabbat, their hands, face, and feet. Again, we, all, all the time you read these things, things have changed over the last uh, century. Habits of hygiene, thankfully, are not, are not what they were in the days of the Ritmaran and the Rishonim, um, for the better. And uh, so he says, but you wash, nonetheless, a person washes on, uh, on uh, we spoke last week about the intention that you have when you do these things. A person can wash themselves, take a shower on Friday, and take a shower on Friday. Or, you think that the shower is for the sake, it's for the honor of Shabbat, so it becomes a mitzvah. That is, that is Kavod Shabbat. And he continues, Mikvod Shabbat, Shabbat Ksut Mikyah, you should wear fine clothes, clean clothes. Vlo yam abusha cholkam abusha Shabbat, don't wear the same uh, clothes you wear on Shabbat, the clothes you wear on a weekday. Again, going back in the Gemara, we discussed this two weeks ago. People only had one garment, so it was a, it was a big deal to change the clothes from, from Shabbat to, to uh, Chol. In any event, that is Kavod Shabbat. Continues the Rambam, Ezehu Oneg, what is Oneg Shabbat, an enjoyment of Shabbat. Zeo Shamoch Hamim, Shabbat Lazaken Tachsiu, Shamen Bayotel, Mashke Mubusan, Mubusan, Shabbat, Akolapi Mamono Shabbat. Based on your financial status, have the, the best uh, food that you can have, that is Oneg Shabbat. And here explains the Gra, the Gaon Vilna, source number seven. He says, Lashon al Rambam, Melchot Shabbat, Abad Vorem Yamu Shabbat, Shnaim Minatora, Shnaim in the voice of Rim. So he says there are four things which are said about the Torah, four aspects of, uh, about Shabbat, excuse me, four aspects of Shabbat. Two are written in the Torah and two were from the prophets. So he says, Zachor v'shamor, which were from the uh, from the Torah. V'shenei pashor edenevim kavod v'oneg. We add on to those kavod and oneg. Nema v'karakta v'shabbat oneg l'tosh Hashem m'chubar. That's in the words of the uh, of uh, Yeshayal, in the words of Kiddush, it's on Shabbat morning. So Ezel Kavod, Kadeshim Na Adamina Minhala Mana Min Vasuda, etc. As we discussed in the previous year, part of Kavod Shabbat is on er what you do on Arab Shabbat. The fact that from Mincha time on Friday, you don't have a large meal. That is Kavod Shabbat. You are anticipating for Shabbat itself. And Oneg is that which is on Shabbat itself, but Kavod Ruba Ered Shabbat. Kavod is that which is before Shabbat. Okay. And we can. Sorry? No, you're certainly not going to light the candles on Shabbat, but you have to prepare them and you have to set it up before Shabbat. The candle, i.e., maybe it goes back. So maybe it goes back to what we said. Is the emphasis here on the action that I'm doing or is it on the result? The action which is done before Shabbat, that is an act of Kavod Shabbat in terms of setting up, making sure that the lights are lit. On Shabbat itself, the onyx Shabbat is that I have the lights lit, that I'm sitting and not eating in the dark. And that is a, that's that's the result. Okay, so those are the first two understandings. They're yeah, very similar, Kavod and Onik Shabbat, some of the nuance between them. There are other uh, distinctions that are made. In fact, if you look at page 77, Yerucha Shulchan makes a different distinction here between Kavod and Onik Shabbat. The truth is it applies, it, it, it makes sense for the candles. It's difficult to apply to other aspects, or other uh, applications of Kavod and Onik Shabbat. This is what he says. He quotes the Rambam, source number 12. Um, and he says about halfway through, in other words, that these contain both kavod and oneg. Very interesting. You could uh, you could have said it the other way around. It says the Arucha Shofan. He says light needs to be lit, not just in your. Uh, and we'll see in a moment why. Not just where you eat. But in all the rooms of the house, and he says in the room where you eat, that is, those candles are Kvod Shabbat. In the other rooms, that is Onig Shabbat. Um, and therefore, the candles themselves contain Kvod and Onig. Okay, but have a look at the page before, on 76. Again, in the Gemara, we're going back a couple of the previous prior. Source number eight says, Amar Rabba. So this is a famous halakha. And if, again, which thankfully is not so relevant nowadays, hopefully, 
Um, but if a person has, unless there are very extenuating circumstances, says Rabbi, if a person only has one candle, and it's Friday night or Hanukkah, so you either you can light a candle for uh, Nerot Shabbat, or you can afford to buy a candle for now Hanukkah. Which one should you light? Which takes precedence? Says Rabbi, now Beitor Adi, the light, notice also, it doesn't say now Shabbat, it says now Beitor. That's how now Shabbat is called. The, the candle of your home, the light of Shabbat, that takes precedence. Why? Nishum Shalom Beitor. Because of Shalom Bay. You can't because they, 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 they're different, different purposes. The truth is that, first of all, you may have there are different candles, there are different wicks that you might be that, 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 that you might use. And um, the most uh, obvious difference between the two is that now Shabbat, the very essence is that you're meant to benefit from the light. Now Hanukkah, you cannot benefit from the light. You can see it, you can look at it. Just, exactly, you can't get it. You can't. It says. You can't get any benefit from the light of uh, the Hanukkah candle. That is one of the reasons why we light the Shamash. That if a person should happen to be near the light and inadvertently use the light of the candles, you're using the light of the Shamash, which is not actually one of the Hanukkah candles, and that's okay. But now Shabbat, its whole purpose is to light up the room, to use it, to benefit from the light which comes from it. So they, are, they have completely different, there are different brachot, and there are different, uh, 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 different purposes for each of them. So therefore, but says Rabbi, and this is agreed by everybody, that it's uh, that it's uh, the the candle of of Shabbat which takes precedence. He then says, "Now told the kiddush hayom. What if you can only afford either to get not necessarily Hanukkah, either, but you can either have a candle or you can have wine for kiddush. That's it. You can't afford both." He says, "Now told again, the candle comes first because mishum shlom beito." The Rambam takes the very interesting direction over here. He asks the next question: What if you only have between the Hanukkah candles or for Kiddush? Which one takes precedence? I'll leave that to your Bible. But that's uh, but that's uh, what. So the Gemara here says that now Shabbat comes takes precedence over now Hanukkah because of Shalom Bay. and therefore we have now a third reason, a third understanding why we need a Shabbat, uh, the candles on Shabbat in the first place because of Shalom Bay. This is maybe, maybe the most famous reason. Rashi here says, what does Shalom Bayit mean? He says, number nine, People will get very, very, very upset. They'll start fighting with each other if they have to sit in the dark. And therefore, it's Shalom Bayit. The Gemara later on expands it. It says, source number 10, What does it mean? My soul is removed from, uh, far off from peace. That's the Pasuk in Eta. Amar Rabbi Abal, Zo Harlakat Ner Shabbat. That if you don't have the lights, the, the Shabbat candles, you won't have this uh, shalom. And explains Rashi there. Okay, simple chat understanding. What, why is now Shabbat going to increase shalom by it? Because if you don't have the candle and your house is dark, you're going to walk home and you're going to trip into the wall, and that's that's what's going to lead to. Uh, so uh, people are going to be falling all over the place and getting very, very angry. And that is it. So Shalom Bayit is by having light, having light in the home. Sure. Now, I'll just say it's interesting that, at least we, we've said, that there are three reasons why we need uh, Adlakat uh, Nel Shabbat. We've said Kavod Shabbat, we've said Onik Shabbat, and we've said Shalom Bayit. The way that the Gemara uh, spoke about Shalom Bayit, we couldn't actually say the Quran didn't really give any reason why we light Shabbat candles. Just said we light Shabbat candles. We were left to the Rishonim to try and find out why. It did say between Ner Shabbat and Ner Hanukkah, Ner Shabbat takes precedence because of Shalom Bayit. So you could understand that Shalom Bayit is the fundamental reason, which how many do understand, is a fundamental reason why we have this enactment of Shabbat candles in the first place. Or you could understand no, we have Shabbat, we have Ner Shabbat because of what Shabbat and Onik Shabbat or whatever it is. When it comes to the question, which takes precedence, so we say now, now uh, Shabbat first, because of Shalom Bayit. But it's not that it's an intrinsic reason why we have this, uh, why we have this takana. Would there be a ramification to that? Maybe, maybe not, but it's worth worth mentioning. Um, I mean, you always want to have Shalom Bayit. <laughs> yeah, but... Um, Okay, so so but what comes out of this is when we see if Shalom Bayit says says Rashi that we don't want to trip all over the place, 
again, the, the nafka mina between them would be if it's only to do with Kavod Shabbat and Anik Shabbat, so that's only the, then I only need to have the candles where I'm eating. If there's a broader reason, maybe I need to have candles and have light in other rooms as well. That's what we saw in the Yeruka Shulchan. Huh? Mishnah Bura says over here, uh, source number 13, bottom of page 77, he says, uh, you should have light in all of the rooms you're going into on Shabbat. Uh, at least one candle, even if you're not eating there. Again, nowadays, this part is very easy to fulfill. Meaning, the, we asked the question about electric lights, just in a moment. Um, Let's question about electric In terms of the primary lighting, when we say the bracha, that is going to be a question, that whether we can use electric lights or not. But in order to fulfill this idea that the rest of the house should not be completely dark, so we have some light, whatever light you have there, that would be enough to fulfill that part. But he does say, to the Mishnah at the end, says, bracha that the bracha should be said on the candle that you're lighting in the place of, of uh, eating, and there are amount over the page as well. So the main, the primary lighting of candles is where one eats. We'll, we'll see. We'll see soon in terms of lighting elsewhere. If one cannot light there, what, what, what you should do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question was asked if you need, if you really need light in other rooms. But everybody agrees you need the light, the candles in the room where you're eating. Everywhere else. So what I'm saying is, if we have you know some light that's coming, you know, from the hallway or from whatever, where enough that when a person walks into the house. They're not going to, it's not going to be completely dark. You don't have to leave the lights on in your bedroom so that you can't go to sleep. No, that's certainly not, not required. That's probably the opposite of Shalom Bayi. But, uh, <laughs> but leave all the lights on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you, you need to have, the, the point is, it needs to be light enough so that a person's not going to be especially stumbling through the dark and falling all over. That can be accomplished by electric lights or whatever, a lamp or whatever one has. One does not have to, one is not required. And I think, I don't think I've seen this anywhere. Where aside from the main, the primary candles with one lights for the, with the bracha, if you have other candles throughout the house, I mean, I've seen that that is not uh, not something which is which is unfair. Okay, and we'll get to it precisely where one should light. We'll, we'll, more details to talk about there. Let's talk for a moment about how many candles one should light. How many candles? So there is a yeah basic requirement and custom, and you'll see there are actually many customs that have established been established. Throughout the ages, I think there is one which is more universal nowadays, but it's interesting to see again where that came from and, and, and what else. So, page 79 says the Shulchan This is very similar, I think this is taken from the language of the Rambam. Then he says that both men and women, everyone is obligated to have within their home candles. But he doesn't say candles, he says candle. He says, You have a light burning, a candle. Even one who is poor and does not have, uh, is not able to buy, needs to go in bed, begs have enough uh, oil or a candle to light one candle. There we see again, on Shabbat. But yeah, the Shulchan Ruch mentions one candle. So me karadim, right? Same thing by Hanukkah, by the way. Hanukkah and the mitzvah now issue beito. The, the primary obligation for any of the lights of Hanukkah, the person had lit one candle, they have fulfilled their obligation. We all do Mahadrim and Mahadrim, and, and we light more. But if a person only had one candle, they fulfilled the obligation. Same thing by Shabbat as well. This is important to know in extenuating circumstances. The person is not at home, the person is in a place where it's difficult to light, it doesn't have access, whatever it may be. But one candle, you have fulfilled, you fulfilled the obligation. Uh, Mishnah Bura says as well, I'm not going to read it inside, but he says somebody who doesn't have, who has very, very limited funds. Again, if the question is, I can buy two candles, or I can buy one candle and, and uh, certain extra food for Shabbat, he says buy the one candle and buy the extra food for Shabbat, that is a that, uh, application of the uh, of, uh, Onik Shabbat. But already very, very early on, we go into the days of the Rishonim, we see the Kolba over the page, 
page 80, source number 17. Says the Kobo, but Tanchuma Matsati Kom Mile de Shabbat Kafu. We see when it comes to Shabbat, everything is double. It always comes in two. Shnek uh, Vasim, in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, korban, that there are there are two uh, that there are two sheep that are brought. Mizmor Shir Leom Shabbat. The Shir Shal Yom of Shabbat is called Mizmor Shir. Both words meaning a song. It's a double song. Mizmor Shir. Lechem Mishne. We have two loaves of bread. Uh, we'll talk. We'll get to we'll get to Lechem Mishne later on. Zachor v'Shamor. So these are the two uh, uh, the two uh, ways in which Shabbat is uh, spoken. Right, this is the source. This is what everybody knows. We light two candles. One can egg is Zahor. One can egg is Shamor. It's not just Zahor and Shamor. All the aspects of Shabbat are double. And so uh, that represents that idea, says the Kol. This is one of the early sources for the fact that we light two uh, candles. And that is a universal custom where people light, where people light two candles. Um, Shulchan Aruch quotes this. Number 18 says, Right, we, we have two candles to light. Says the Ramah, Interesting, says the Ramah, doesn't say why, not sure, that there was a custom to light why two when you can light three, and why three when you can light four. So you can light three or four candles. The Mishnah brings that they were different. It's interesting, the Ramah says, that was the Minah. I'm not sure. Until when that was the minag, when that was changed, the Mishnah Bura says there was somewhere the minag to light seven candles. Why seven candles? Seven days of the week coming up to Shabbat. There are those who have the minag to light ten candles, right? That's how they brought, and one of them is one of them is Shabbat. Again, now there were there were for skin that were that were uneasy about this because again, especially mentioned standards of hygiene are, uh, today are different to what they used to be. The standards of you know fire safety as well are much better. There was there was always a real risk. Very early on, the Mishnah Bura writes, it's very interesting, one of the earlier uh, simanim of Yom Hotzkila, that there used to be, you may have seen, it's more common in the uh, inspiry shuls, they have this, this parchment with the shape of a, a, it's a drawing with the shape of a menorah, it's called a shiviti, shiviti Hashem, and it has all different pukim uh, and different words, and it's written in a specific order with gematria, and, uh, you know, the, the Ashkenazi Siddurim are generally pretty straightforward. You have the Tzvidot and that's it. And the Sfadi uh, Siddurim, so you have the, the Kavanot and the different things to think about and Gematriot and these, these uh, illustrations are quite common. Uh, anyway, they used to have on a piece of parchment they would have this illustration to help you with your Kavanah and you would have it in front of where the Chazan would stand and they would light candles. They would light candles uh, next to this piece of parchment and the Mishnah Barat writes against this. Why? Because it's a fire hazard. You, you couldn't, Chas uh, Vachalila, the Shul could burn down. So in those days, you're lighting seven candles, you're lighting ten candles. Where they were placed, there were well, no smoke along, for sure not. Um, so not everybody was so happy about lighting all these candles. But these are some of the different men again. Again, I haven't really heard of anybody who lights uh, seven or ten candles for this reason. But nowadays, there is another uh, uh, minhag, which is very prevalent. Rav Morcha Eliyahu writes in his comments for Shulchan Aruch, source number 20. He says, Yes, no, God, that lit the mishpah and she'abayim. To light like the number of people in the household. So a woman adds extra candles for every um, for every child. And that is quite a common minhaj. It's not clear where that came about. It's actually not clear necessarily what the reason is. We can speculate. One of the ideas that's brought, actually, is that it's connected to Hanukkah. The same way that we know by Hanukkah, the Nahadra mina Mahadra, that, that well, there's an idea of a lighting to Mispa and Shehabai. Right. On Hanukkah, we light the Karadin is mitzvah near Ishu Beitol. One candle for everybody. Every household lights one candle every night of Hanukkah. You fulfilled your obligation. There is Mahadrin, which is no, you light according to the number of people in the home. And then there is Mahadrin in a Mahadrin, which is every night of Hanukkah, we in Beitila, we hold like Beitila, where we increase. So the first night we will light one, and the second night we light two, the third night we light three, etc. Um, but that idea of lighting to Mispah and Shreyabai, that is brought explicitly in the Gemara regarding Hanukkah. So there are those who think that it came from Hanukkah and now we do it on Shabbat. We light like Mispah and Shreyabai. Um, another reason that's brought, we're going to see that it's brought in the Rishonim, that if a woman was unable to light on a certain uh, Shabbat, that that uh, she needs to light an extra candle every week after that. So there are those, there are those Poskim who said, that on the week when a woman gives uh, gives uh, birth, 
as a child, if he's in hospital, if he's unable to light, or there was a minhag not to light on that week for whatever reason, and therefore you light an extra light. That, those are some ideas which are brought. Also, number 21, uh, I'm not sure who that is. Rabbi Israel Friedman, it says, yeah, he writes the following. He says, in Amin Agan Hashem, Ben or Bat, Mosifim Nerecha. So we have the midnight today that when a woman gives birth, then she adds another candle. Samach le davar adam nishum b'amunim b'msechet shabbat v'bolit b'amem adlikim. There is no source for this in the Gemara of saying that you light an additional candle for each member of the household, except for Hanukkah, as I mentioned. There is no source for the Vodim Shabbat. What it does say, however, is the following. It says, Debishra shema bin b'nerot b'shabbat have le banin b'chatanim rabanan ayen shan. It says that in the merit of lighting, I don't say exactly in these words, but in the merit of lighting candles, one will merit to have children who are Tamidech uh, Chachamim, who are Torah scholars. The way it's phrased in the Gemara, I believe, it is a Ragil Bener, somebody who is regular with the Ner, somebody who is, uh, who is uh, uh, insistent and fulfills this mitzvah uh, adequately, will have uh, what will be Zohar. To, uh, to have righteous children. That is where the minhag comes from for many women to say a prayer specifically for, for, for children at the time when one lights the candles. Um, so saying this, I, just, I have to mention, there's a beautiful interpretation of this which says the following. The chat is again, we're talking about Shulot, we talked about it seems to be there's something uh, mystical, there's some power. Okay, you do this mitzvah, you light the candles, and in the merits of that, you'll have children of Talmud Echa coming. Why? What's the connection? So there are those who explain like this. It's not what it means. There are those who explain when it says Ragil Bener. What does it mean, Ragil Bener? One is accustomed to the candle. It means one is accustomed to the light of the candle. In the olden days, how would you, you didn't have electric lights in your home. It was dark, it's at night, the only way. You sit with the book by the candle, and that's the way you read. That's the way you can learn. So it says Ragil Bener. Somebody who is sitting by the light of the candle and is learning, somebody who learns themselves. So then they'll have children or they'll they come in because they'll see that you, they'll see that it's important to you. They'll see that you you uh you will practice what you preach, so to speak. So that, that that's the idea. We teach, we know we teach others more far, far more by what we do than by what we say. And it's by modeling. So somebody who's Ragil Banar, somebody who's all the time is learning, it's more likely, there's no there are no what's that guarantees, but it's more likely that one's children will become Tamil Khamim in that way. Okay, but the pshat over here seems to be that uh, that uh, one who uh, there is there is a connection, there is an association with the idea of lighting candles and the way of one's uh, uh, one's children, and therefore we have this minhag nowadays of uh, lighting an extra candle, an extra candle for for all the children who are uh, who are born in the family. Um, Shmirat Shabbat in source number twenty-two adds on. He says, "Vamed amorim." This applies when one is at home, and lighting in one's own home. But when going out and being a guest somewhere else, over Shabbat, it's not necessary to add the extra lights. Two would be uh, would be sufficient. Okay, they don't need to be as big as the candles that one normally lights at home. Um, whatever they provide, you, that is okay. And uh, two candles, two candles is fine. Uh, I just mention in this context, we have that uh, my wife has a has a beautiful men in our home that whenever they light lights the candles, so together with uh, maybe other people do this as well, but together with the children, and then there is an extra candle for each uh, for each child. So she always yeah. asks them where to think about the week and think about what you've done and where have you why do we light extra candles? Because every every child brings more light into the world. And they discuss where over the past week have they brought extra light into the world in their actions as well. That is a uh, and that is a beautiful idea connected to this to this as well. Okay, what if one forgot to light? As we mentioned, uh, we alluded to that already. The Maharil is one of the Rishonim, Rishonai Ashkenaz, says that there is a penalty that is that is imposed if you didn't light the candles. He says, uh, we'll just read what's in bold. He says, He says, So if for whatever reason it happened, a woman forgot to light a candle on a, on a certain week. By the way, notice here that he also says, He didn't light a candle. That might imply that it's going according to the Tara Hadim, <laughs> only one candle is required. Um, but every week after that, she should light an extra candle in order to uh, to repair for that uh, that uh, candle that she had not lit. 
number 24 of the page, the Ramah, he says, So one week you should not light a candle. Every other week you need to light three candles. Excuse me, you should not light them two. Or to add an extra one. Because you can make an extra one. 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 You can add, you can add as many as you want, but don't, don't go down. Mishnah Bura points out, this is only if it was in your control. If there was whatever reason, a person didn't have candles, a person there was some emergency, Arab Shabbat, she was unable to light, and therefore, therefore uh, she couldn't do it, she's not required to add extra candles after that. Now, the Poskim nowadays do discuss that they say like this. They say, if the reason for candle lighting, whether it's Kavod Shabbat or Onik Shabbat or, or Shalom Bayit, if the idea is that one needs to have light in one's home, right, so there's a knasya, there's a penalty, you see, which is imposed, if there was no light in the home every other week, a woman subsequently needs to light an, ex, an additional candle. But what if there was light in the home anyway? Okay, so she didn't light the candles, she forgot, but the result of the takana, of having candles lit, was there anyway, would she still have to come and light an extra candle? What, is so, that, what does that mean? The canal is there. What, what does that no, mean? Meaning the result of, of the Hadakat Narod had still been be achieved in the fact that there was light in the home. Look at that. We'll, we'll see in a moment. So the first response who discusses this, Melamed uh, Loyal of David Hoffman, he says, let's say, I don't know what the exact case was, so there may be some of issues here of another type. He says that the case was a wife forgot to lie, but the husband lit, lit the lights. I don't know why. But that's, that, was, that was the case. So she forgot, so she would have to add. But the cameras were lit. The cameras were lit here by the husband. So he says, um, nonetheless, it would seem she would still have to light the extra candle because she was still negligent in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, lighting the candles. Again, why in this particular case the husband didn't just remind his wife to light? I don't know. But that's the case that he could have given his time. It was too late for her to light, and he had, he had additional time by which to light. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Why would it be when she when she lights candles? I can still I, I'm I'm still doing what I need to do. I, I, you say I you say you're saying it was earlier was before Shkia. Yeah. I mean, a woman accepts accepts Shabbat when she lights candles. Yeah. But if she hadn't lit the candles, she hadn't accepted Shabbat. So oh, so she would still have done. Whatever it is. In any event, he says she would still have to in future weeks. The Shevet Alevi, number twenty-seven of Vosna. Uh, he, he talks about our case. He forgot to light candles, but he had electric lights on. Right? So do we consider this the same as one who forgot and would in future weeks need to light uh, need to light extra lights? He says uh, like this, page 84. If you look at the, at the top, the second paragraph on the top page 84. It says, There is obviously no source in the Rishonim for this, because they did not have electric lights. He says, I still think this is called uh, that she forgot, and therefore the penalty would still apply. Other poskim, of Badi Yosef, of uh, Rubiat, and 39 Menachot, say no, they will be included. That uh, should not be required. So certainly if there's any kind of an honest, there's any kind of extenuating circumstance, why somebody, uh, why, uh, why we forgot to light candles, in any event, then he says he wouldn't have to add on, and if there was, there was electric light in the house anyway, we would not have to, should not have to increase the number of lights she lights in subsequent weeks. Is the ritual of lighting the candles not exclusive for the women? Who said that? The house, or assuming a guy is not married, you are presenting it. If somebody is not married, they would have to light. That's correct. Right. So, the problem is that you get the people, the one who is completely struggling with the husband is the candle. Right. So, so again, I don't, know, I don't know what the case is over there, but you're right in that. And the Rambam said it, the Shulchan Aruch said it. It's like Chad Nashim Bechad Nashim. Everybody has an obligation that mm -hmm. candles should be lit. And from this, we get into all sorts of interesting questions. What happens if somebody is away, right, and is not uh, at home? What happens if you have a Chayal who is uh, who is in uh, you know fighting in Gaza, wherever it may be? His wife is at home. She lights the candles at home. Does he have to light where he is? Fascinating questions that come up. But uh, or if, the, if if she's away and somebody lights in her house, does she still have to light? Maybe we'll get to some of these questions next week. But the point is, when you but at home, nonetheless, the primary obligation is on the woman. If both the husband and the wife are at home, then the then so right, the woman is the one who lights the candles. It's not his. It's not his mitzvah. Next week. Next week. Oh, next week. 
next week. Okay. Okay. So, there's a, like I said, there's a lot here. We've got, we've got a, one, one topic at a time. Okay. So, we spoke about we spoke about how many tonight. We talk about what one should use to learn. Page 85. Okay, I think we'll, we'll, I think we'll conclude with this. So, maybe the, maybe the electric lights, maybe we'll talk about electric lights now briefly and we'll carry on next week. So, over here, the Mishnah in Masechet Shabbat talks about different wicks and different uh, fuels, different oils that one can use for lighting uh, for lighting candles. We already said you can't use tar because it has an unpleasant smell. Now, again, a lot of this discussion is less relevant in our days, even though this, these Mishnahs are very familiar because we say them every Friday night in Shabbat. We say, also, there are different minhagim in terms of when Bameh Madlikim is, uh, is recited. We do it uh, the more prevalent custom in Israel is that we say it before um, um, before Baruchu, but before Marit. There are places in England, for example, the custom is recited actually later as part of Marit, which is uh, which is, is a little bit strange. If the idea of reciting by Mehmet Likin is that we say it before Shabbat comes in so that everybody is reminded and knows to go and light the candles, etc. But in any event, um, a lot of these discussions are less relevant nowadays because we don't really make our own candles the way they used to. I'm sure everybody has seen you know, the, what the candle, which the Mishnah and the Gemara talks about, is very different to our candles. You have this clay pot, a small receptacle, uh, uh, and within it you place the oil, and then you take the wick and you put the, the, the wick inside. And there are all sorts of discussions that come around because when the oil is, when there is a small amount of oil, the wick begins to flicker. And then what people would do, not on Shabbat, sometimes on Shabbat as well, but hopefully not, not on Shabbat, is that they would, they would take the, the candle and they would lift it up, they would tilt it in order that the wick should draw from the oil so the light should be, should be clear. That is why the Mishnah actually says, mentioned before, Agil Benan, the Mishnah says that on Shabbat, a person should not read by the light of the candle. Why? Because we're worried that it may start to flicker. And what happens? You will pick up, a, you'll pick it up, you'll tilt it, and that is you're causing the oil to be drawn towards the wick. And that is the melacha of mazir on Shabbat. That is melacha of la, essentially lighting the candle. And there's a story in the Gemara in terms of one of the Tanaim who would go and he said, the Mishnah said, Lo yikral It's a Mishra and Adam Kashuv, and he says, I, I can read, I'm going to read, I won't tilt. According to one version of the Gemara, he uh, he started reading and he was about to tilt the candle and he stopped himself. According to a second version in the Gemara, he actually tilted the candle on Shabbat and he writes down in his pinkas, in his notebook, after Shabbat, that when the Beit HaMikdash is rebuilt, I'm going to have to bring a korban because of the fact that I was Mechal al Shabbat. Yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating uh, discussion there in the Gemara. But again, nowadays, uh, this doesn't really apply because we just go and buy our candles from the shop or oil. Some people use oil, some people use wax candles. Again, the light that comes out, whether it's wax, whether it's oil, whatever it is, is clearer than uh, many of these candles that were used in the in the days of the Mishnah, days of the Marat, and there would be no problem with that. So long as it's a normal, ordinary candle, ordinary oil, the light is bright and it doesn't uh, flicker, and that is that is fine. There's no question. Tosfot writes here, Tosfot in source number 34, Page 86, he said, He says that uh, olive oil is the ideal um, is the ideal form of using for the uh, for the mixer. Shulchan Aruch writes the same thing um, in number 35. But the Mishnah Burra, again, on 36, he says, so long as you have a, a producing a clear flame, and certainly wax candles, whatever it is, and nowadays produce a clear flame, that is fine. There is no uh, there is no question of that. That is that is kasher. For the for the next one. Just say a couple of words about using electric lights. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, electric lights raise two different issues. One issue that it raises is the fact that we already have electric lights in our home. Can we still go and say the bracha on Shabbos candles? I think we're going to have to talk about that next week. We don't have time today. But the second question is: Can I use the electric light in the in place of the candles? Maybe I don't have candles at home. Maybe I'm someone where the, it's if a person goes to a hotel or somebody's in a hospital in yeah. July that you aren't able to, it's a fire hazard, can you use uh, electric lights? So let me just read to you, before we get into the book, just two paragraphs from Rav Asha Weiss. This is not in the text in front of you. But Rav Asha Weiss says the following. In one place, he says, two places in the same article, I think. He says, 
מקום אחר לפי דעתי אני אעשה לקיים מצוות חכמים כי עיקר סכנתה He says we have to establish, we have to fulfill the, the enactments of our sages in the way that they enacted them. The Chachamim Tiknu Adlakat Ne'er Shabbat. He says at the end of the day, when, when our sages told us we have to light candles on Shabbat, the mitzvah is about lighting a candle. Tiknu Adlakat Ne'er Shabbat. Ve'ein anu b'mitzvah zo elah adlakat ane'er. And for, in order to achieve that, it's not just about light, it's about there's something about a candle. Even nowadays, you go to certain places, you go to a wedding, you go to a restaurant, you go to a certain, you know, you have the light, but there's a candle with a certain ambience, there's a certain atmosphere which it, which it creates and it provides. Whether it relates to the candle of Shabbat, whether it relates to the bracha of the ha'esh ha'yichavdara, the geber ner, what is a candle? The skin talk about this regarding uh, Shabbat. They also talk about it regarding Hanukkah. The question comes up. He says, he says, a candle is something which has got fire, which is consumed. There is a material, there is a fuel which is consumed, and there is fire. That is a uh, that is a candle. Okay. It's interesting. In the same place, a little bit later on, the same Rav Shavai writes the following. He says. You all heard what he just said, right? He says, "Ain't that he muhlated pein yamze?" He says, "Nonetheless, I'm not completely uh, certain about this." The man or man or man in the bear bola meno a moderni kasher miyom leyom a technologia mitkademet u mishtaletet al kol haolam. So we have to be realistic and understand that in our world, technology is changing all the time and it's taking over the world every day. Things change. Ukva lo mishtam shem klav benayot kvei lafitz ol era bekashmal bilvad. And nowadays we don't. Notwithstanding what we just said, but candles, you don't use candles to provide uh, to, uh, to provide light unless you are you know, in the place where they turn off the electricity. The only reason people make candles nowadays is for these places and ceremonies and, you know, for Nerat Shabbat. So he says, Certainly, we have to say that when Chachamim established the Takana to have Hadlakat Neot Neot Shabbat, right? We can we aren't changing the Takana. We aren't following a new establishment. We have to follow what Chazal said. So, on the one hand, maybe, but the question is, what did Chazal say? Because there was no electric electricity in the world at the time. When they said you have to light candles, did they mean? You have to light candles specifically, i.e. a flame and fuel and a wick, and that's what we want. Or you could say, they said you have to light, why are we saying candles? We're saying candles right. because that's what we have. That's how we have light in the world nowadays. But if there'll be a different scenario, a different situation, where nobody uses candles anymore, but the way, the appropriate way of lighting is by, by electric lights, neon lights or LED lights or whatever it is. So maybe that's included. And therefore, he says, at the end of the day, his tendency is to say you cannot use electric lights, but maybe there is what to talk about. And we'll see again. What, what, I think everybody will agree. We'll see in the sources next week. But everybody will agree that the default position when one lights Shabbat candles, one uses a candle, candle oil, whatever it is. But when we are in extenuating circumstances, a person is in a hotel, a person is in a hospital room, a person is in... Fascinating questions that are coming up from the soldiers in Gaza in terms of what to do about Hadlakat Nerot. I saw a question this week. Somebody's in a house in Gaza over Shabbat. They want to light candles, but when it gets a bit darker, they have to turn the candle, have to extinguish them because it's going to be dangerous. Are you allowed to, this relates to what we discussed two weeks ago, are you allowed to light candles in the knowledge that you're going to have to turn them, that you're going to have to extinguish mm -hmm. them? Or is it better not to light them in the first place? That's okay. And anyway, so that is what uh, Rosh Hashanah says over here. I'll just end with this. He says that's regarding Shabbat. Now, regarding Hanukkah, could a person use an electric Hanukkah uh, to light? He says the following. He says, uh, So Rabbi Shabbai said, It's obvious and clear to me. By the way, Rabbi Shabbai was a little bit uh, more lenient on this issue. But he says, It's obvious and clear to me that you cannot light Hanukkah lights with electric lights. There's something else. The whole point of the lights that we light on Hanukkah is a zechel It's a commemoration of the miracle. 
And the miracle of the lighting of the menorah in the Beit HaMikdash, which was clearly not uh, electric, that was, uh, and it has to be in the same way. And therefore he says, and the truth is most poskim will agree that one cannot, uh, that one cannot use electric lights um, uh, for a time of care. As I mentioned, the Shlomo Zaman Arabah, I think, is, uh, is lenient under extenuating circumstances, maybe even with the bracha. But, uh, but the default position is use ordinary candles or your, or your oil. Obviously, do it in a way that is safe. You're not going to create the fire hazard. Okay, there's more to talk about here in terms of uh, using electric lighter Shabbat candles, but I think we'll stop for today. We'll, so we'll pick it up from there next week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just saying that if the candles didn't invite you to light it afterwards, but it's not uh, it's not uh, yeah. a premise. What, what one does need to be careful, one shouldn't light in a place where the, the Gemara says, where a place that's windy and the light, the candle is definitely going to be extinguished, so you shouldn't be lighting there in the first place. You should light in a place where that's so. Uh, if there's a chance that it may happen and it's not intentional, that's something else. Accident, you know, accidents happen, uncommon uh, wind come, comes along. But uh, one should not light uh, in a place that it's definitely going to be extinguished. Unless you're an Okay.